Welcome to The Access. I'm your host, Heidi Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing U.S. policy in Syria, U.S. foreign policy towards Venezuela, and the recent Trump-Kim Jong-un summit. To talk about all of this, we are joined by Michael Flanagan, former U.S. congressman, and Mark Simakovsky, non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thank you so much both for joining us today. Uh, let's start uh, by talking about Syria. Uh, right now, the decision by the administration is to keep a couple of hundreds of soldiers in Syria uh, for a limited time uh, before the complete withdrawal, while others now are hoping that this is going to be something that's going to be a little bit longer term, uh, so nobody can attack these areas that have been protected by the United States and the SDF forces. What would you guys comment on that, whoever wants to start? Michael. I spent... Uh couple of years in Iraq living on a military base and uh, unless they have a presence working out into the countryside or into the local cities they're little more than a target for uh, for terrorist activities for for insurgent activities or for others um, and they provide a little in the, by way of safety or security mm -hmm. and a few hundred forces aren't going to be able to do much of anything mm -hmm. so uh, other than having a, a flag there uh, to do some some work and, and give some advice and help train, I'm sure. I don't know that they have much of a, an effective fighting capacity uh, mm -hmm. because of the numbers and ability. Uh, but just having the United States there often gives a lot of hope and courage to people who have to work against insurgency. So it may be good to keep them there for a while. To bolster their numbers, and I don't think so, and I don't think we're going to do that. And to pull them out eventually, I'm sure, as we reach a, a settled peace in, in Syria is probably going to be the conclusion. Mm -hmm. No, I would what just say mean? the decision, or if you can call it a decision, to uh, freeze at least some U.S. military presence in Syria, I think highlights the continued confusion of the Trump administration in what exactly they want to achieve in Syria. Uh, clearly, there was a lot of opposition within the U.S. government when President Trump unilaterally announced the withdrawal of U.S. forces. It took the Pentagon and many in the National Security Council by surprise, particularly National Security Advisor Bolton. So I think what you're seeing in, is some of the president's advisors, maybe even U.S. allies, impressing upon the president the need for continued presence, albeit small and albeit limited in its operational impact, mostly because of political leverage in giving the United States a seat at the table in any future negotiations uh, with the Syrian government or with Russia or with Iran as well as uh, leverage in trying to continue to remove Iranian presence, uh, the U.S. ability to limit, cap, or even prevent any further encroachment of Iranian military presence will be directly correlated to whether or not it has a presence on the ground. If the U.S. takes away the forces in eastern Syria, you can forget about any leverage that the United States has in trying to prevent. And also deterrence. Mm -hmm. Without a U.S. military presence in northern Syria, Turkey is able to have a free hand in operationally targeting and focusing militarily on uh, eroding uh, the Kurdish forces in northeastern mm -hmm. Syria. And so I think for many of those reasons, that's why I think you see a, uh, a very vague promise of a continued U.S. presence. But frankly speaking, if I were the Kurds, uh, the Iranians, the Syrians, or the Russians, you know, the U.S. has flip-flopped on what it wants out of Syria. Mm -hmm. And I think very easily President Trump could wake up, again, upset with his own national security team with the plan of staying in uh, and also continuing to feel uh, confident that the removal of U.S. forces politically benefits him. And I think part mm -hmm. of the reason why he pulled the U.S. forces out is he saw it as politically beneficial for the 2020 elections to be the man that pulled U.S. forces from international engagements from Syria to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that assessment? That I, it's I, just a political the, gain? The, the, the left continues to be uh, incapable in of making up their mind whether Trump is a political genius or a political idiot. Uh, I, I don't, I, you know, they're, they're whatever they need to be for, for today's question. Um, the Kurds have been the military's a stalwart pal for a long time, but politically not so much. Um, they have territorial ambitions in Syria, as do the Turks. Uh, the Russians are the lead player there and have been the lead player there from the beginning. And while our military does keep us a seat at the table, this is a true fact, the fact that we're not there uh, with thousands of 
boots on the ground as the uh, neocons would like to have seen, shows the ability of this administration to actually guide its own path in trying to make sure that we have a presence, but that we don't have an enormous national commitment uh, to this getting done a la Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, additionally, the, uh, the northern corridor of Iraq from Iran, uh, currently guarded by the, the popular mobilization front uh, mm -hmm. of the Iraqi forces, is really little more than an Iranian uh, front group, or has become one, and has guarded that border uh, and provided direct passage for Iran into Syria and continued their ability there. I think our presence has a lot to do with checking that and mm -hmm. the illicit trade that moves from Tehran to Damascus mm -hmm. across northern Iraq through the PMF <laughs> activities is probably has as much to do with what they were there as the Kurds or anything else going on. Mm -hmm. Syria is, uh, is a Russian show and it has been from the beginning and we will continue to have a seat at the table because we have people there, you're absolutely right. But it, we're not... Uh, we're not going to be a, a big name player in the future of Syria or in its decisions. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll be at the table, but we're not going to be making the rules there. And I think it was never our intention to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to ask you, Mark, about a point that Michael made, which is that those 200 soldiers there are not going to be, uh, basically, they're going to be an easy target uh, for insurgency, uh, specifically a terrorist possibly Iranian militias? I mean, what, what type of threats are we going to be facing with having only this amount of uh, soldiers? Now, are they protected by maybe uh, some air forces somewhere around? So you can assume that, you know, any presence of U.S. forces, uh, the commanders on the ground are going to have operational plans to protect those forces. Mm -hmm. Those forces will still be protected by U.S. air cover. Uh, by uh, intelligence as well as capabilities uh, in terms of artillery just across the border in, in Iraq. And of course, any of those forces could be operationally surged as needed. Uh, the issue I think Michael has raised is their effectiveness will be severely limited. I think mm -hmm. they will be able to conduct small scale, uh, you know, counter terrorist, counter ISIS activity. Uh, but those forces will be uh, very concerned in the, the scope and scale of the military mission that they're going to be able to conduct at such a small level, mm -hmm. I think will be severely limited. Again, in a larger capacity, U.S. forces in that part of Syria have been tested. They were mm -hmm. tested by uh, Russian-backed private security forces. The mm -hmm. U.S. had an overwhelming military response. You could imagine that other actors that are going to try to test and undermine the U.S. presence, whether Iranian, Turkish or Russian, will only feel potentially more emboldened, knowing that uh, the U.S. presence is limited. And again, the, the goal of any of these actors who are seeking areas counterproductive to U.S. interests is a Lebanon scenario, that if they simply can strike small, isolated U.S. bases, that the willingness of the American populace and the American president to sustain that presence, if, say, a dozen American casualties or God forbid, 50 to 100 American casualties occur, uh, likely there, it's a higher likelihood that those forces would be withdrawn rather mm -hmm. than rather than pulled uh, up. So of in many course. ways, uh, they are a sitting target, and the U.S. Uh, has to be very concerned about uh, how they're going to defend those forces because in many ways they're not there for an operational reason. Yes. They are there obviously to counter ISIS, to counter ISIS. But there are plans to protect them. There, there, there would definitely need. be plans to protect them and the full scale weight of US military power will yeah. be behind those forces. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it would be very dangerous for anyone to try to counter those forces, but they will be challenged. Uh, yeah. And there could very easily continue to be sustained American casualties in Syria. And again, it, it becomes more difficult for the American president to defend uh, casualties after a large-scale withdrawal mm -hmm. because that political commitment uh, which the US administration has to argue to the American people has to be sustained of why mm -hmm. are we in Syria why is it that we need 200 more well that's what I want to ask you I mean if you Michael you touched a little bit on this that those forces are gonna stay in Syria because they need to be monitoring the Iranians and especially those forces the militias uh, that on the Syrian border, basically trying to smuggle arms, weapons, uh, drugs, drugs, whatever it is that they need to do um, into Syria and obviously to the Mediterranean Sea, are those forces staying in Syria for now just for this? Not just for this, and, and uh, Mark is right. They're, they're, they're also there to give aid and comfort to the Kurds and give them mm -hmm. strength and say, we're still here, you know, mm -hmm. you want to do what you got to do. But 
the numbers are small enough uh, that they are part of a larger intelligence operation, part of a larger military training operation, a larger mm -hmm. military exercise operation, and of course to have actual um, uh, operations where they'll go out and do small things and you know blow this up, blow that up, and come back and, mm -hmm. and, and have s surgical strikes, I guess as we used to call them, mm -hmm. against uh, ISIS and perhaps against uh, the Republican Guard as, as their elements are there as well. Mm -hmm. um, these, are, these are not small things to, to shrug off because as I said, there are more than a few uh, organizations or countries there, or you know, maybe factions there, mm -hmm. uh, looking for territorial ambition. And the Russians are also looking to maintain mm -hmm. bases and other things there as well. Everyone wants a little slice of Syria. Mm -hmm. And they might let Assad keep it, they might not. Mm -hmm. But we're not, we're there as an honest broker because we have no such ambition. We yes. have no territorial ambition there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, while we're there, we're making sure that nobody can really exercise theirs either. Mm -hmm. And so the, the 200 is important, uh, but it's, it's, it's hopefully we're on our way to being able to solve this problem in a different way than just mm -hmm. having soldiers there. Because as, as I said, I spent two years tethered to a, to a stick in, in, in Iraq, and, and I got rocketed several times a day by the time I left. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, in a fairly stable area of Iraq where you just, you were dealing with the Muqtad al Sadr's mm -hmm. uh, militia. This is not stable at all, and, and these guys are, these guys are in a tough way. Mm -hmm. So um, it would be nice if we can work out a better way to exercise foreign policy than having troops on the ground standing there waiting to get shot at. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that being the case, that is their job. I that was in the military myself. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you're asked to do very hard things. And, and mm -hmm. this is one of those times. This is one of those times. Just, yeah, what would we like to quickly, add, Mark? Uh, I think the poverty of the administration's approach is the lack of a strategy on what exactly mm -hmm. they want to achieve. You hear mm -hmm. one ambition out of the president's mouth that we're there to fight ISIS, and that's it. Mm -hmm. You hear the National Security Advisor publicly stating that our ambition to stay in Syria is to ensure that uh, Iranian troops withdraw. Uh, from Syria. Mm -hmm. And then the Pentagon also saying that the war with ISIS is not done and we have to sustain our commitment and we have to train yes. our, our partners. And then there's the period in, in after. Syria. So as a result, you have mixed efforts. messages to the American people. American mm -hmm. people don't understand why we're there. There's no uh, clear strategy that this administration has provided to the Congress as well as to the public. So sustaining that small presence will be difficult because of that confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, just the latest statement has only reinforced that confusion. Mm -hmm. Why are all of a sudden are we flipping back to staying in Syria? Just staying with, you know, with a couple of hundreds of, of soldiers. Do you think uh, those soldiers are enough also to monitor the Iranians trying to cross through the borders? Yeah, I mean, obviously having a, a physical presence there uh, is better than, than none at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Iran has capabilities to reinforce its personnel uh, besides using the land border. Mm -hmm. There's an air bridge, obviously, that flies daily from Tehran to Damascus. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a significant existing Iranian presence in western Syria along Israel and Lebanon's border. Mm -hmm. You know, the main, I think, leverage that the United States has is by sustaining a presence there, they have the ability to reduce, they'll never be able to remove Iranian presence, uh, but at least reduce or cap Iran's presence in some sort of a negotiation over Syria's future. Mm -hmm. We saw in the Bashar al-Assad's last visit to Iran how he met with Khamenei, with Qasem Soleimani, uh, not the foreign ministry of Iran. It was very directly related to the IRGC. Um, and the United States keeps, you know, uh, I mean, like we've heard before, like you just mentioned, John Bolton said that we want the Iranians out of Syria. We know that uh, Israel wants Iran out of Syria. But what is the strategy? I mean, knowing that now Assad is completely uh, under the protection of Iran as well as Russia. But Iran is the only party that is willing to fight all or nothing to keep Assad, while Russia could actually sell him out if they had to. Um, what do you what do you make of of this strategy towards Iran specifically in Syria? Let's start with you, Michael. Assad was an expedience for the Russians to be able to have a flag planted, and he's our guy. So as long as he's useful to us, we'll keep him. Iran needs him. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit of a different situation, uh, and uh, I fear that uh, that with uh, Russia's tacit approval of uh, Assad staying, he's not going anytime soon, mm -hmm. uh, and they continue to grind out. 
polls of their areas and say he's very popular and he <laughs> should stay and all that. And uh, and the, the international media chews on that and thinks it's just delightful and uh, and it simply isn't so. Uh, he's a vicious despot and should have been gone a long time ago. I don't think that's going to be anything that we pound the table for either, because mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we're we're in a position or of a mind to try and make the rules in Syria. I think we're there, as uh, has been observed, to defeat ISIS and then several other smaller intelligence things, uh, not watching the Iranians among them. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that uh, the problem that we're going to have going forward with Assad is directly linked to the Iranians and their ability to exert influence throughout the region. Their own economy is in deep trouble and their ability to bring in hard capital from outside is dependent upon many of these activities in Venezuela too, in South America, where they're working as well. Yeah, that's affecting them too. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a drain, but it's also a source of, of hard currency for them, mm -hmm. which they desperately need. Uh, and so they will continue these international activities for exactly that reason. And we need to watch them and check them where we can. Okay, what do you think, Michael? And yeah, just quickly, I think the main argument that likely the president's advisors used uh, is that a continued presence in Syria is important for the administration's Iran strategy. I think that probably is what resonated most with the president. Uh, this administration is conducting a maximum pressure campaign on Iran to try to put as much economic uh, pressure on the regime uh, with the hopes of either regime collapse or uh, a better negotiated outcome for the nuclear deal. Again, mm -hmm. I think both are highly unlikely. Uh, a U.S. presence in Syria continues to put pressure on Iran, and I think that likely resonated with the president. I think, you know, the uh, time has passed where the U.S. can dictate the future uh, of Syria or seek Assad's removal. The Iranians and the Russians essentially have gained uh, at least a short-term victory mm -hmm. on ensuring the livelihood of Assad and the staying power of the regime. Uh, and again, the United States can, could play a minimal role in kind of preventing certain things from happening in Syria, but I don't think the United States is going to be able or this administration is interested and willing uh, in committing significant political capital to see uh, Assad's uh, removal. So as a result, I think the main goal and the objective is try to limit Iran's power in Syria and uh, potentially put pressure on it, make life difficult for the Iranians, and you need some sort of a presence in Syria to make sure that happens. But again, I don't think this president is committed to our troop commitment. And so mm -hmm. at some point, I think you're going to see American withdrawal from Syria. Maybe not today, uh, but potentially uh, after uh, 2020. Well, what about uh, Israel? Because, you know, we know that Israel has its own strategy in Syria. They don't want to see any Iranian presence. They continue to say that. Uh, we saw that Russia provided the Assad regime with the S-300 anti-missile system, and then they said that they activated them recently just so Israel could strike Assad's uh, forces, I mean, especially the Iranian forces, again, near Damascus, and uh, there were, we didn't hear or see anything about the S-300. Again, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu met with Putin, and there are talks that maybe there is an agreement with Russia that, you know, Israel is just going to keep striking the Iranian militias all over Syria and Russia is not going to do anything about it, that there is some sort of agreement there. Do you agree with this? Or is Russia, um, I mean, does Russia see Iran as its own and, and most important ally, ally in Syria? Our, uh, our foreign policy throughout the history of our country has been based on a series of personal loyalties. Um, the, the pres this president is, a, is a, the pinnacle example of that. We tend to have permanent friends and permanent enemies. Mm -hmm. And it's sad and it's wrong that it's true, because it's not an effective foreign policy. But it's the one that we've always, we've always worked with. And what do you mean by that? Well, I, you know, no. everyone in Europe is always our friend, regardless of mm -hmm. how they behave. You know, everyone in, in, uh, in, in uh, Islam is viewed mm -hmm. difficultly, if not as actual enemy, and, and it's permanently so. They, they, have mm -hmm. a, they have a hill to climb over uh, before they can be called our friend, and almost all the time we have to invade them and, and occupy them for a while before mm -hmm. we can hug them. It's a sad and wrong way of going about business, and Republicans and Democrats have both been guilty of this, of, of having a predisposition in their foreign policies, not just an expedient one. The Russians have an expedient foreign policy. Mm -hmm. What's good for me today is good for me today. And what's good for me tomorrow, we'll see about that tomorrow. And so if the Russians can see an advantage in dealing with Israel today, 
even though it may sell out the Iranians who they've been dealing with, they will do it. And I think they see that advantage. Mm -hmm. I think their interest is keeping a permanent presence in northern Syria, near the Mediterranean coast, and Israel is a way to get that done. Mm -hmm. Iran was a way to get them in and keep them, get them in a position of advantage. Israel is a way for them to stay there. And I think that they have a foreign policy built on expedience and the capacity to be that nimble in selling out this guy today for another one tomorrow. So yes, I think, I think it's entirely possible that Israel and Russia will get together on this. I disagree. What do you make with I disagree. This? I think uh, you know Russia and Iran uh, are cohabitating together and have a policy of mutual convergence in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, both would like to see the sustainment of the Assad regime. Uh, the Russians were obviously comfortable in uh, an increase of Iranian military presence. Uh, also saw that as uh, a way to pressure the Israelis to seek a more cooperative relationship with Russia. You're seeing the result of that. Netanyahu has visited uh, Moscow more times than Washington uh, mm -hmm. over the last several years. The Israelis are very pragmatic in understanding that uh, many of the roads in Syria and in their own security increasingly now lie through Moscow. Uh, but you're not going to see a grand bargain between Russia and Israel that would somehow lock out, freeze, or decapitate Iranian presence uh, mm -hmm. in Syria. The Russians don't, uh, neither don't have that control over mm -hmm. Iran. And also they continue to work both sides, as they always do. They're going to continue to see a benefit of having some sort of Iranian presence, uh, which will do the dirty work to shore up the Assad regime. They've had to put very limited boots on the ground. Uh, and they want to ensure that in the future, uh, Assad is protected by those Iranian boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it, that pressure also will always continue to put pressure on the Israelis. Uh, and frankly speaking, you know, Israel is, is not necessarily seeking uh, Russia's permission in uh, Syria. Israel mm -hmm. will continue to strike Iranian targets with or without Russia's permission. It will limit its military activity based on uh, the extent of Russian military presence and protection mm -hmm. of some of Assad's forces. But all sides know that each side will be doing something counterproductive to the other's interests. That's why you have con seen continuously Israeli striking targets in Syria irrespective of the S-300. And, yeah, and, and then we didn't see them get activated no, and that, either. and that will continue as well. And mm -hmm. so this is, you know, a game that's being played. Um, but of course, two of those three parties uh, want to see uh, Israel less reliant on the United States as an mm -hmm. arbiter in Syria and to undermine the U.S. position in the Middle East. And that's the primary goal that has brought of Russia and Russia. Iran uh, together. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a withdrawal from Syria, uh, as well as uh, Israeli frustration with Washington over the course of Syria and as a result movement to Moscow mm -hmm. in terms of visits all serves that wider purpose uh, of, of severing or trying to sever the link between the United States and Israel which again I don't think is occurring uh, but I don't think it's a coincidence that you see Netanyahu traveling more uh, to Moscow to talk about Israel's security than to Washington. You wanted to comment? Well, I don't disagree with, with, with much of what he said. I just I took it to a further extent than, mm -hmm. than our friend did. I, think, I don't think you're going to have uh, uh, Russia put a knife across the throat of, of Iran today. Mm -hmm. But I think if they're forced to pick, they'll pick Israel because mm -hmm. Israel leads to their permanent stability there and Iran does not. Mm -hmm. I think Iran is a country that's teetering closer uh, than, than others think they are. Uh, and I think that their behavior... Uh, internationally indicates that uh, their, their wants and need. There's there's an example of protection rackets being built in Iraq. There's there's uh, there's all sorts of ways of trying to pull hard currency mm -hmm. to Tehran in in the most grubby small way because they're so desperate to have even a small amount of it in little mm -hmm. pieces. Uh, Syria is part of that strategy for them, and if they can be strangled off or, or they're going to teeter and fall off, I think the Russians would be quite uh, quite pragmatic about that. Let's move to Venezuela. Um, I mean, we saw that right now even uh, Guaido went back to Venezuela. So far, he's good. Uh, people were worried and concerned about him, um, you know, having or seeing any uh, attempts to assassinate him or hurt him or detain him uh, by the uh, Maduro regime. What do you make of the American position on Venezuela? Is it tough enough? Is it not tough enough? Is it conflicting, as you uh, were mentioning, uh, about the policy and strategy in Syria? What do you make of it? 
the situation in Venezuela today. You know, I think first and foremost, you have to, uh, uh, it's important to see that Maduro uh, is a detestable uh, dictator uh, whose departure will benefit uh, the Venezuelan people uh, and regional security. This is a man uh, that has worked to wreck an economy that was one of the strongest uh, economies and one of the innovators and leaders of human capital uh, in the entire Latin America region. Uh, you've seen an exodus of excess of 2 million people. There's uh, figures showcasing potentially 1 to 2 million more in the next year. Uh, and so the economy and the people, it's a humanitarian disaster, potentially the largest humanitarian disaster in Latin American history. Mm -hmm. uh, for that sole reason, the United States should be opposing and seeking ways uh, to ensure there's a tr transition to a democratically elected uh, leader in Venezuela. Now, the means at which the United States chooses to do so uh, and how and why this administration is very interested in democracy and human rights mm -hmm. promotion uh, in our neighborhood, while caring very less about it uh, around the world, mm -hmm. is in question. Um, I agree this administration should continue to put economic pressure uh, on Maduro uh, through sanctions. I think there's some concern about wider uh, oil sanctions that will impact the U.S. economy, impact oil prices, as well as impact some of the, uh, our economic interests in, in uh, the southern United States and the refineries around Texas. Um, but I think we should support the Guaido government. Uh, I think Guaido is a unique opportunity and one that surprised many Americans because it is finally a consolidated opposition in Venezuela and a charismatic figure that's willing to go into the country at a time of personal peril. Uh, so I think we should continue to support him. But I think this administration is a bit optimistic on the timeline. Uh, mm -hmm. And also uh, the use of military force in Venezuela, I think, would run counter to U.S. interests uh, and also run counter to some of the views of our uh, regional partners. Um, so in many ways, I think we have to be more realistic in how long it may take uh, to remove Maduro from power. How long would it take, do you think, Michael? I would be surprised if next year at this time he were still in power, mm -hmm. and I think it may be considerably less. Um, the military aspect of this is not is not going to be a U.S. flag military mm -hmm. operation. Um, if any military is required, and I'm not sure any would be, uh, it will be Brazilian or mm -hmm. Colombian or a combination of both, mm -hmm. um, encouraging our South American friends to police what is literally their backyard and our kind of back backyard. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's an opportunity for the United States, not just to, to uh, get rid of an evil, evil man and an evil, evil government built by an evil, evil man just before him, uh, mm -hmm. Chavez, and let's not forget his, uh, his role in the destruction of that country mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but it's also an opportunity to build relations with partners in South America on a common goal that we can all agree on, uh, and that's rehabilitating Venezuela and helping the glorious people be glorious again. They have some of the dirtiest oil in the world. It's sulfur-laden. It's really tough oil to refine. And there's mm -hmm. only a few places on Earth that can refine it. You can't just mm -hmm. haul it off anywhere. Texas is one place. China can refine it. But oddly enough, Citgo, the, the largest company involved in, in the oil there, is, it has a very large stake of it owned by Russia, which is a mm -hmm. big surprise to everybody. <laughs> um, again, back to Syria, back to the Iranians, and back to the global geopolitical problems with all of this. These same players seem to be interconnected everywhere on the globe. And who's in charge here and who's in charge there is, is uh, I think, a matter of very interesting uh, and, and very important understanding. Um, the Russians run the show, more or less, in, in Syria. We're taking the lead, diplomatically at least, uh, in Venezuela. But all the same characters have all the same interests. Uh, and you know the Iranians but are on the ground it... with, with their groups and mm -hmm. their cells doing their work as well. In, in Venezuela, but yeah. I mean, isn't it geographically more challenging for these players to have the exact same influence? Oh, of course, of in course. Venezuela, and, especially and with the surrounding countries. And, Venezuela. And that's part of my point is that geographically, you know, mm -hmm. you're there, you kind of do that. We're here, we'll kind of do this. Mm -hmm. There, you kind of do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, how much could Russia do? And it's trying. You know, I the, mean, you talked about military <clears throat> options. Russia is trying to give whatever it can to support Maduro's regime, but how much could they do? You know, the Russians have a lot economically sunk in Venezuela. They've provided billions in loans and credits mm -hmm. and guarantees over the last decade to the mm -hmm. Venezuelan regime to include military assistance. Um, but also, this is not Russia's backyard. 
and the military capabilities that they have in Ukraine and Syria uh, will be much more difficult for them uh, to surmount. I don't see a direct Russian military uh, intervention here to uh, support the regime. Uh, Maduro has Cuba is trying. Yeah, Cuba is on the <laughs> ground, and there are thousands of uh, Cubans and advisors. Uh, Maduro's personal security, uh, and this is part of the problem and part of the challenge in peeling away the Venezuelan military from mm -hmm. Maduro is uh, the Cubans have been preparing for this moment for a very long oh. time, and they understand who is loyal, and they've sought to weed out the Venezuelan military officers uh, not? that were not loyal. Not and ideologically so, loyal. Right, exactly. And so in many ways, the Cubans have been preparing for this scenario. They're experts at this. Uh, they're on the ground uh, in Venezuela. But I don't see, I also see that there's limits to Russia's intervention. I don't think that they want to double down now on mm -hmm. the Maduro regime because they see it faltering. Mm -hmm. They're going to continue to cast the United States as a rogue actor trying to uh, sub subvert the sovereign state of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. But just as the Chinese have been very hesitant uh, to uh, supplant uh, U.S. pressure, uh, the Russians will continue to find ways to make life difficult. So the Russians built an oil refinery to process this very heavy crude in India. Mm -hmm. And the Indians have been, I think, the third largest importer of Venezuelan crude mm -hmm. behind the Chinese and behind mm -hmm. uh, the United States. Uh, and I don't think it, it is a coincidence that this administration now is targeting India for some trade actions because India has stepped up to take some more Venezuelan crude mm -hmm. uh, as of late. So, again, I think Russian and Chinese interests are uh, deep in Venezuela, but their willingness to support and su uh, supplant U.S. pressure uh, is limited uh, okay. because in the end, everyone is going to have to figure out how much they all lose if Maduro falls. And the next yes. Venezuelan government is going to be very interested in taking stock of how Russia and China uh, position themselves. Mm -hmm. And if they want their credits uh, paid back at some point, Russia and China needs to be very wary about how it opposes the opposition in Venezuela mm -hmm. uh, and because they will want ultimately to be paid the billions of dollars that Venezuela owes them. Well, Iran through Hezbollah also has interest in Venezuela. We know that there is a people like Tarek Laisami, who is the vice uh, president, president, and he is a Syrian of Syrian descent mm -hmm. uh, who worked directly with Hezbollah and the Iranian regime on drug dealing. Venezuela was an umbrella for uh, these um, basically uh, drug cartels all over Central and South America. Um, how much could those do, and uh, how much presence do they have today in Venezuela, the Iranian proxies? You know, I think part of the uh argument and the rationale that this administration has effectively made is the Maduro regime is a criminal enterprise that has siphoned billions of dollars uh, from the Venezuelan people through illicit trafficking. Hundreds of billions. Yeah, hundreds of billions mm -hmm. of dollars. So through illicit trafficking, drug trade, uh, uh, weapon smuggling, and the uh, legitimacy of this regime, because they also stole the last election, uh, is eroded. So any presence of Iranian Hezbollah or narco traffickers uh, and that's what all of these sanctions were intended to do, was to target individuals, not to target the Venezuelan economy initially. Uh, again, further showcases that uh, this regime needs to go. But is Iranian influence dominant in Venezuela? Absolutely not. Uh, and I, I think we should, at our peril, try to connect uh, this kind of rogue triangle uh, that all of the uh, bad actors in Latin America, whether it's Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela, are all somehow working together to subvert U.S. interests. This administration is very ideological and is trying to make that argument, but I think that could tip the scale uh, of our regional partners who are always mm -hmm. so very wary of U.S. intervention in Latin America because we have a very complicated history in that region. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why Elliot Abrams, uh, the new special advisor for mm -hmm. Venezuela, has been such a lightning rod because he was involved in uh, controversial U.S. policies in Central America in the 1980s. Uh, this, as uh, you said, I think is an opportunity to work with our regional partners to let them take the lead, not for another Panama in Venezuela, which again will reinforce the United States as uh, a very difficult and hawkish actor. But in Latin the United America. States saved Panama. Yes, but also the United States uh, removed uh, a leader in Panama and also has been involved in many actions, whether in Cuba and the Dominican Republic in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, removes sovereign governments from power. And many of the countries in Latin America remember that, and the people of Latin America are very wary of the United States coming in and bullying 
uh, the countries in the region. And that's why up to this point, you've seen hesitance in, in Brazil, uh, the new Mexican government is very wary yeah, of supporting. Yeah, those are very president. corrupted uh, regimes that you're mentioning, that they're very worried about the United States. And I, I want to I wanna give that to Michael, just yeah. because, you know, we might disagree on this coming, you know, I'm coming from Syria, yeah. so I, I know those governments, so-called governments that worry about the United States very I much. Don't, uh, they don't want to arm wrestle with my friend here, so I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> my, my brother, oh, my, my, my brother, no, no I, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's too much polemics in our work these days. It's much more fun to, to talk uh, thoughtfully. Um, my, my brother Sean, oddly enough, actually dropped into Panama with the 82nd to, 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 get, to, to get him. And, and uh, um, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, who, who pulled that off, that was, that was a singular and odd action by us to protect the United States, not so much to regulate Panama. And I think it's a one-off thing, and I don't think that's the best example you could have given from the point you were trying to make. Because the point he's trying to make is not wrong. We don't need to be a bully in their backyard. Uh, that's that's not our job. Uh, El Norte is is not uh, uh, there to regulate and, and control South America or Central America. However, when uh, when the regimes crop up that are a direct threat to our national security, we'll act, and they, they know that. And and that's usually enough to keep it close to control. When you have some that are completely out to lunch. They are dedicated to harming us. You could argue that in Nicaragua and elsewhere. Well, then that's another matter, and you're going to have you've picked a fight with with the baddest guy in the block, and, and we're not going to walk away from it. But it doesn't mean we have to start any business there. And I think mm -hmm. our attack in Venezuela is the appropriate one. We're on the border with plenty of humanitarian aid. We're ready to pass out bread and rice to anybody who wants it. Just let us in and let us do it. And if military is required. It will be uh, from Brazil or from Colombia or from somewhere else. It will not be Marines marching in. And I think, I think that if we were going to march in, we would have already. And mm -hmm. so I, I don't think that that is on anybody's planning uh, mm -hmm. desk here. And I think the, the Brazilians, the Colombians, they have a view on how this should be done as well, not just as our agents. Mm -hmm. but, and, and their view is patience and wait and let it come. Mm -hmm. And I think it will in time. Maduro is panicky. He's jumpy. He's, you know, closing the borders, parking things. I mean, he's, he's, not, he's not behaving in, in a way that, that, that's, a, that's a man settled in, in his job. This mm -hmm. is a guy under siege, and he can't go on much longer. So yeah. I, I, think, I, think he's, I think he's got troubles. However much he may be propped up by others, narco-terrorists, people feeding him money, mm -hmm. I think they're working out, you know, how many millions he'll have, how many he gets away with, mm -hmm. uh, how many, how, where he gets to go. I think that these discussions are happening at a level that, are, that, that, that we should be comfortable with. Are you as optimistic as, Mark, as uh, Michael is? You know, I agree that the <clears throat> next year he will not be likely in power in Venezuela. Uh, I think there's still plenty of scenarios uh, that could occur, either an attempted coup from within his regime, which I think is the optimal scenario that his military internally yeah. takes care of it. Um, but, you know, this administration continues to say that all options are on the table. Um, transitions rarely occur uh, as we expect them to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so even a Maduro withdrawal uh, could be bloody. There mm -hmm. are uh, colectivos on the ground in Venezuela that are heavily armed. Uh, the ELN uh, and other groups from Colombia have their own interests uh, mm -hmm. in supporting. So I think we should be very careful in how this transition occurs. Uh, but Michael's absolutely right. The reason that Brazil, Colombia, and other regional actors are involved is because their own security is undermined by this. Yeah. There are millions of Venezuelans they, that they have to clothe and feed, mm -hmm. and so yes. it's untenable. And they're, they, yeah, they're coming, you know, so at they some wanna, point, this, hungry. this scourge in the region has to be removed, mm -hmm. and uh, the exodus of Venezuelan people have to has to end uh, because it's undermining regional stability. And that's why I agree the United States has to be involved. Would they the, do this? Would they go in militarily like uh, Michael suggested? I think uh, Brazil I think the, and Colombia. If they had to, I think they're very hesitant to involve mm -hmm. the military. I think their military will be, will be prepared to facilitate humanitarian assistance, but a direct military intervention uh, from Latin American countries, I think, would be unprecedented mm -hmm. and unlikely. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about the um, meeting between uh, in Vietnam between President Trump and uh, Kim Jong Un. It didn't go as expected. Why? People usually expect that when two presidents meet 
they already have figured out the deal before they have met and they're just going there protocoly, you know, to, to just kind of showcase their agreement and sign whatever they agreed on. That's what's not what's happening. Well, this is an atypical time. administration. And I think part of the uh, driving force of the president was his belief in himself and his ability to convince uh, Kim Jong-un uh, of a negotiated solution. Mm -hmm. I think many of the president's advisors warned him of the unlikelihood based on where the negotiations were going ahead of Vietnam, uh, that the Koreans would be willing to uh, uh, release enough nuclear uh, um, you know, evidence as mm -hmm. well as remove enough facilities that would make a uh, you know, release of U.S. sanctions worthy. But again, the president wanted to do this meeting uh, for optics. Uh, he saw a lack of success since the last summit. Uh, and so I think this was a, a great failure because we gave significant credibility uh, to Kim Jong-un with the second summit, uh, and we didn't get much in return. Granted, we don't have a conflict, which I think is a good thing, and I think mm -hmm. we should be talking with the North Korean government. Uh, but summits are made for solutions and results, mm -hmm. and there was not a result, uh, and the expectations for this summit was a signed agreement to the mm -hmm. point where there was a table prepared for a signed agreement. Uh, and that was not achieved, and I don't think the president uh, wasn't warned about the unlikelihood of an agreement. And so in many ways, I think this is a, a failure of the administration to, to meet uh, the objectives that it laid out uh, since the summit uh, a year ago. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Michael? Do you agree with Mark uh, about this uh, summit as a complete failure? And do you think we're going to see any uh, further meetings, negotiations, and maybe an actual agreement coming up? Well, it wasn't a complete failure. In fact, you could almost describe it as a success and from, right. the, from the standpoint that we continue to negotiate with North Korea, which was not happening before at all by any of the previous three or four administrations, other than sending them food and hoping they won't, you know, mm -hmm. shoot at us. Um, the president comes at foreign policy from a way that bureaucrats, people in the government, people associated with the government, um, are uncomfortable because there's, there's a way that this is done. There's a table, there must be a signing. I don't, I don't fault him for saying that. That, that, mm -hmm. that. He comes from a very good place saying that. This is an atypical president. This is a guy who's from the business uh, world, not mm -hmm. from the government world. Mm -hmm. This guy has huge changeover in staff. Government people are very very calm. They, they like, oh, I, I've had the same chief of staff for 25 years. That's a good thing. In mm -hmm. business, that's a, that's a disastrous thing mm -hmm. to have the same set of leaders for that amount of time. The economy changes, we need new leaders. Um, he had, there's a dynamism about him that you don't ordinarily see in government types who, who proceed in this way. And that's why he's an agent of change in so many ways. Um, did he personally believe that he was going to be the guy to make this deal? Yeah, I think that actually is right. I mm -hmm. think he really thought that this is his negotiation, not a, an all-government negotiation. And mm -hmm. the only way he can make that negotiation is to sit across the table from him. He didn't get the deal he wanted, and he left. Okay, mm -hmm. Reagan did that in Reykjavik. worked out pretty good. Um, there's precedent for that. And I think this is a two-step forward, one-step backward, two-step forward, one-step backward process. Mm -hmm. And the process so far has resulted in he hasn't shot at anybody in a long time. Mm -hmm. He hasn't made noises. He's at the table talking with the diplomats. We're not getting the progress we'd like to have, but then again, we're impatient people and we like things today and mm -hmm. it'll come. And I think that we're actually, this is, this is part of progress. This mm -hmm. is what progress looks like now, as opposed to what it looked like in the previous handfuls of administration. And that is a lot of of peacemaking and deal making and, and coddling these sorts of people so we can have calmness now, but with no view on a finality of getting rid of bad guys like this or, or a greater peace in the region. What about China? Uh, there's the economical war, uh, also there's a lot of negotiations there. Um, even critics of this administration say that the administration is doing a really good job on China in the trade war. What do you think? You know, I mean, I think we're obviously heading toward a, a trade deal with China in the next few weeks. Uh, there's likely going to be a summit between uh, uh, Premier Xi and the president uh, in Mar-a-Lago. I think the president has made signals that a deal is likely. Mm -hmm. uh, the substance of that deal uh, is not yet known. And I think we're clearly going to see significant uh, Chinese purchases of U.S. agricultural, U.S. energy, uh, some of the concessions that would that would narrow uh, the trade imbalance between the two countries. I think 
The part that this administration has had less success of is some of the structural issues in mm -hmm. reforming the Chinese economy, uh, the things that the Chinese themselves are very resistant to changing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't necessarily believe that this deal will address those uh, as coherently as uh, some China hawks uh, in the administration would like. But I think the president has made a decision that uh, a deal is better than no deal, and the U.S. economy needs it. And those structural issues can be addressed in future rounds of negotiations. Mm -hmm. uh, but some would say, like in North Korea, there was an objective for this negotiation. In Korea, we have uh, denuclearization as our objective, mm -hmm. not simply talking. Mm -hmm. And I think as the administration has gone on on North Korea, they realize they're not going to be able to denuclearize North mm -hmm. Korea. They're going to accept something less, which is what previous administrations. So in many ways, I think this administration uh, likes to create a, a belief that it can get these negotiations completed and get mm -hmm. everything what it wants to achieve. But it's starting to realize no one gets what everything they want to achieve in a negotiation. Uh, and maybe that's okay. I think that is okay. You're never going to get everything you want. Mm -hmm. uh, but whether or not the president is able to achieve what he wanted out of the China negotiations uh, remains to be seen. But Again, I think he will clearly describe it to the American public as the greatest deal uh, that the United States has ever had with China, uh, and it pushes the ball forward uh, for the United States. What do you think, Michael, about the negotiations with China? Well, um, with the reformation of NAFTA, which the, the legacy media was absolutely silent on, so you know it was a wildly successful thing, um, in considering their attitude with this president. Um, I think that they'll get the deal they want with China. Mm -hmm. And the question is, and a great question was asked, is what is that deal? And what, what, mm -hmm. how, how broad and how lengthy? And I don't think this president in any of the deals that he has made or worked on is interested in a global solution to all things today. Mm -hmm. I want to make the best business deal I can with the tools we have, and we'll revisit it in a year or three or five, mm -hmm. and we'll work on other portions of it then. And so I think uh, from his point of view and from the point of view of, of the administration he's built, they will get a successful deal. Mm -hmm. Whether it's successful in the mind of the permanent bureaucrats who view it globally as a big success as opposed to the, the narrow goals that the administration has remains to be seen. Uh, but I think that, uh, that in, in the view of what they went in to get, I think they'll come out with it. And, mm -hmm. and China is no small actor in regard to Korea as well. And so this is all intertwined, intermixed, and intertangled. And as we continue to keep the, the China uh, cookie dangling, you know, we continue to sit there and work on that deal, Korea remains at the table, and that's not an accident. Uh, and I think that that dynamic will continue. Thank you so much both. That was wonderful. I would love to have you uh, sometime soon in the future to Anytime. talk about Thanks for your time. more issues. Thank you. Sure. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for sticking with us. Good night. <laughs>